Let's keep talking about relations. So here's the setup for this video. So we're going to let S be a set, R a relation on S, and little s an element of capital S. And we have the following extremely important definition. So definition. So the equivalence class, so equivalence class of little s under the relation R. So we're defining what it means or what is the equivalence class of little s under the relation R. Well, what is it is it's a set. So it's the set. So it's an S with a little bar. It's a set of all the X's in S that are related to little s. So X is related to little s. So if you have a member of this set, then it's related to little s via the relation R. There is more common notation that is often used. Uh, people usually use a bracket. I'll stick to the bar notation. So just a quick remark on the definition. Remark. If R is an equivalence relation, I'll abbreviate it EQREL, <laughs> then in particular R is reflexive. So S is related to S, hence S is in the equivalence class of S, so the equivalence class of S is non-empty. So if you have an equivalence relation, the equivalence class classes are all non-empty, right? Because uh, reflexivity guarantees that S is in its own equivalence class. In this video, we're going to prove an extremely important result. So let me go to a different color. So proposition, we'll do that next. And there's a corollary to this result uh, that is just key in the theory of equivalence classes. So let S be a set, be a set, and R an equivalence relation equivalence relation on capital S and little s and little t elements of capital S. Then exactly one of the following, one of the following hold. Really, really amazing stuff here. So one, if you take the intersection of the equivalence class of S with the equivalence class of T, you get the empty set. Two, the equivalence class of S is equal to the equivalence class of T. So the equivalence classes are either disjoint or they are the same. So one of the two things will happen. Let's go to a different color for the proof. So we'll start by supposing that one holds and then we'll show it's impossible for two to hold. So suppose that one holds, then two cannot hold, right? Two cannot hold, no way. Two cannot hold. Otherwise, so if it did hold, we'll use a proof by contradiction. Well, by hypothesis, we have that the empty set is equal to the intersection of the equivalence classes. And if two does hold, then the equivalence class of T is the same as the equivalence class of S. So we can replace this equivalence class here with the equivalence class of S. And that intersection is just the equivalence class of S. And that's a contradiction. Contradiction. I'd say, well, why is it a contradiction? Well, R is an equivalence relation. And by the remark above, 
that means that R is reflexive, and so the equivalence classes are all non-empty by reflexivity. So we have a contradiction in that case. Now we'll suppose that one does not hold. So suppose one does not hold. Go a little slower on this on this proof here. Does not hold. A little, a little tricky. It's not hard, but you have to like figure it out every time you do it. It seems. So suppose one does not hold. And the claim is that two holds. Let's go ahead and write down what it means for one not to hold. So if one does not hold, that means that the intersection is not is not empty. So there's an element x which resides in the intersection. So that means that x is in the equivalence class of S, and x is in the equivalence class of T. So what does it mean for x to be in the equivalence class of S? Well, that means that x is related to S. And what does it mean for x to be in the equivalence class of T? That means that x is related to T. So now we have to show that these two sets are the same. So we'll show they're subsets of each other. So we'll start by taking uh, a y in the equivalence class of S. So suppose y is in the equivalence class of S. So this means that y is related to S. And now we somehow have to use uh, what we have. We have this, we have this, and we have this. Okay, so we have to somehow show that y is related to t. Well, first let's use symmetry on this piece here. So since x is related to s, we have that s is related to x. And that's by symmetry. Okay. And now we can use, um, looks like we can use transitivity. So since S is related to X and X is related to T, right? We wanted to combine these and to do that we had to use symmetry. That means that S is related to T and this is by transitivity transitivity okay and now we can use transitivity again so since y is related to s and s is related to t then that means that y is related to t by transitivity once more so by transitivity so this means that y is in the equivalence class of t. So this shows one direction. This shows that the equivalence class of s is a subset of the equivalence class of t. Let's go ahead and prove the other direction. So use a different color. So now we'll suppose that y is in the equivalence class of t. So this means that y is related to t. Okay, that y is related to t. So now what we'll do is we'll use symmetry on this piece here. So since x is related to t, we have that t is related to x by symmetry. Right, so we used symmetry on that piece there. And now, since y is related to t, and t is related to x, we have that y is related to x by transitivity. It requires a lot of thought. You really have to think. Uh, you know, you just try something and, and, and usually it works. And finally, we use transitivity one last time. So since y is related to x and 
x is related to s, we have that y is related to s, and this again is by transitivity, transitivity, and so this means that y is in the equivalence class of s. So we started with an element in the equivalence class of t, and we showed that it was in the equivalence class of s. So this shows that the equivalence class of t is a subset of the equivalence class of s. So thus, these equivalence classes are the same. So condition 2 holds. I don't know why I circled it. I believe it was in parentheses. And that, and that completes uh, the proof. So there's a, a, a corollary to this. Let's, let's go ahead and, and go through it. It's not a long proof, but it's like the key result. So proposition. Proposition. So let S be a set a set and R an equivalence relation equivalence relation you know, on the set and let's let the set of C sub I as I runs through some index set be or rather the collect let that be the collection of equ equivalence classes those are all of the equivalence classes under this e equivalence relation then there are two major major results so then or one major result so then but it's two conditions. These guys, the equivalence classes, they form, and those guys form a partition of S. So what is a partition of S? Well, it means that if you take the union of the equivalence classes, you get the whole set S. And these guys are pairwise disjoint. So they're non-empty if they're different. Sorry, they are, they, are, they are empty. Whoa, they are empty if they're different. So pairwise disjoint, right? Disjoint means they're empty. So equals. Okay, let's go ahead and prove this. So proof. Well, one direction is clear. It's, it's clear that, um, so it is clear that if you take the union of the equivalence classes, well, each equivalence class is a subset of S. So their union is also a subset of S. So that direction is clear. We just have to show that X is a subset, or S is a subset of the union. So take X in S, and then X is in the equivalence class of X, which is one of these C sub I's for some I in our index set. So X, which is in C sub I, which is a subset of the union. So we started with an X and S, and we showed that it was in the union. So this shows that S is a subset of the union of the equivalence classes. And so S is equal to the union of the equivalence classes. Okay, so that shows the first part of, of the proof. Now we just have to show that the union is disjoint. Well, we know, so by previous, we just proved it. <laughs> so by previous, this intersection is empty if we have different equivalence classes. 
So that's it. We proved that if you have an equivalence relation on a set, the set can be written as the disjoint union of its equivalence classes. In other words, the equivalence classes partition the set. And uh, this, this holds for any set, right? This just holds for sets in general. And in mathematics, you use sets for a lot of stuff. That's why this, this uh, pr proposition is so important. So I hope this helps.